Good afternoon, or good early evening. My name, my name is David Thorburn. I'm a professor of literature and the director of the MIT Communications Forum. It's my pleasure as forum director to thank the Knight Foundation, Comparative Media Studies, uh, and the Media Lab for uh, this very exciting collaboration that we've just begun. The, uh, the forum is very happy to, to play a, a small role in this collaboration. We feel that this series on civic media uh, is, is uh, going to do very interesting things, not only within our own community, which is important. I think it's going to be a very import, important discourse for MIT folks, but especially out beyond MIT. And, and uh, the forum is proud of its, of its role as a collaborator in sponsoring the most public of the events connected to the Knight, Knight Foundation grant. Uh, today's forum is the second in what we hope will be a very rich, distinctive series that will run over the next several semesters. Uh, before, I, before I introduce today's moderator, and that will complete my obligations for today, I, I have two other tasks I'd like to uh, t take care of. One is to remind you about next week. You can see the event that's listed on our, on our uh, website for next week. Uh, this is a particularly interesting time for a discussion about television, as some of you may know, because of the strike that has just occurred. And my hope is that uh, we will be able to get these writer-producers, who are really caught in a very interesting uh, pickle right now, to talk a bit about the uh, circumstances of the writer in Hollywood and the effects uh, on, on, on the television industry, especially of the writer's strike, what some of the issues are behind it. And I, I think it's also important to remind folks who, who might have some skepticism uh, from certain angles about material of this sort that, that, that apart from the astonishing success of Heroes as a popular text, and uh, uh, it, it is also a pioneering show, as we tried to indicate in our subtitle, because of the way in which it's exploiting the, the new technologies. Uh, the, Nielsen now tracks the number of hits that websites connected to television programs get, and the website for Heroes gets far more hits, uh, millions more hits, than the next closest fiction program with a website. The, the people who are running Heroes know something about the way, about, this, about how to create synergies with new media that will be certainly part of the discourse we'll engage in next week, and I hope many of you will return for that event. As an added inducement, I can mention that my friend uh, and sor volcanic source of ideas, Henry Jenkins, cited by some people as the newest, as the as the new Marshall McLuhan, is going to be the moderator next week, and that alone is probably worth the price of admission. The second thing I want to do is remind some of you, uh, mention for some of you who are, who are newcomers to the forum, what our basic format is. The f roughly the first hour, although my hope is that the panelists, because they don't have elaborate prepared talks, will compress it even further, since we're starting 10 or 11 minutes late. Uh, the f roughly the first hour is devoted to conversation and discourse among the panelists. And the second hour, almost always the highlight of our sessions, is question and answer with the uh, session with the audience. My hope is that you will be passionate, engaged, even critical and angry, so long as you also remain civil. And it's been, I think, one of the real signature marks of the communications forum, something we've always tried to encourage in our events, is that, is that are these moments of passionate interaction that we can still regard as civic and respectful. That's my ambition for the forum in general, and it's especially my ambition for our discussion today. I hope especially that there are some skeptics in the audience who will question some of the assumptions that, uh, that, that are being made by, by, by folks on the panel, and who will ask hard questions about the application of games to so many aspects of experience. Eric Klopfer, my colleague from MIT, is the director of the teacher education program and co-director of the education arcade at MIT. He is also an associate professor in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning. The teacher education program at MIT uh, prepares undergraduates, uh, prepares MIT undergraduates to become math and science teachers. 
Eric's research focuses on the development and use of computer games and simulations for building an understanding of science and complex systems. Eric will be the moderator and, and uh, empresario for everything that follows. Eric. Thank you. Um, so uh, first of all, I'd like to extend our, uh, the thanks to the Communications Forum and of course the Center for Future Civic Media and their support from the Knight Foundation, um, a, a large contingent of which are here visiting us today. So I'd like to thank them for their support um, I'd also, I guess, like to give a, a call out to um, a, a group, a contingent from Pepperdine who's visiting us today um, and is present at the forum. And uh, I feel like I'm a, a bit of a talk show host. Is there anybody from New York here? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yay. Anybody from California? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, uh, we decided that we, we talked uh, about a week or so ago about what the format we should use for today's uh, discussion should be. And uh, we thought we'd buck the trend a little bit of, of, uh, of any kind of formalized talks and prepare today mostly as a, as a conversation. Um, and we discussed some topics of conversation um, that, we would, that we would have. Um, I'm, I'm a little concerned because these guys are both pretty shy. Um, so there's going to be probably some long, awkward pauses <laughs> where they decide they don't want to say anything. But I'll try to kind of fill in the, the interstitial spaces there. <laughs> Um, but I, I did say I would give them at least a few minutes to introduce themselves and talk about some of their interests and some of their background and some of uh, how they got to the place that they are. Um, so that will, be the, that will be the extent of our formal presentation. Then we'll kind of do a little bit of Q&A. Um, we'll do that roughly for the first hour. I have um, some conversations that I prepared um, to talk about with these nice gentlemen. And then we will open it up to the, to the audience in general to, uh, to have further questions. So that's the format. Um, I will let Mario um, introduce himself and, okay. and uh, talk a little bit about how he got here. <clears throat> okay, great. I want to say th uh, first and foremost, uh, thanks for all of you for uh, inviting me and having me here. It's really a pleasure and uh, an honor to be here, and I'm humbled to share some of my experiences with you this evening. Um, as you can start up on the screen here, I I'm just going to walk you through uh, a little brief background of who I am, uh, because I do think that in some senses, uh, I have a different context or a different perception of some of what's happening as it relates to video games and education. Um, so I'll walk you through and then hopefully you'll get a little bit of the story of the life and how I ended up here. So number one, I started out as a little kid with an interest in taking apart computer games. My first one I took apart was the Atari 2600. It was a nice thing to do, but my, drove my parents crazy who were on limited funds and would see their, their, their hard-earned money spread out on the living room floor the day after it was purchased. <laughs> so you can only imagine the cringing that they were doing as parents, but they supported my curiosity, which was very important. Um, from that, uh, I somehow ended up with the name Mario, uh, which I found out had no relation to Super Mario. It was more that my father seemed to be into Godfather movies or something, and uh, that's where the Mario came from. But nonetheless, uh, Super Mario Brothers haunted me during high school as everyone would tease me and ask me, where is Luigi? Uh, so that was a pretty big problem. Uh, I then grew up and found myself in the corporate world, and as you can see, I used to push a lot of paper in sales arena around technology. I decided, let me get a checklist going. This doesn't seem like the right path. Decided to do technology and computers and held several positions from network administration to web development to user support, um, of various uh, uh, different positions uh, throughout technology. And it's been this kind of ride on this technology learning curve ever since. Um, from there, I ended up in a unique position after working in the private industry. Uh, the mayor of Baltimore City said, hey, we're doing this thing. Uh, we hear, uh, we're doing this thing called the Digital Harbor. This is out of Baltimore, Mayor Martin O'Malley. And uh, the red tape, obviously, you understand what that means. So I found myself leaving private industry to go head into uh, red tape. And the whole idea was to create a position that wasn't there before that was about bringing technology solutions to the city. In other words, how could we create economic development programs, socioeconomic uh, development programs that could not only enable our citizens to be more digitally savvy and be able to apply for jobs, uh, but also how could we bridge relationships between some of our higher learning institutions like Johns Hopkins and spin out some of their research into the market and how could we find connectivity points to uh, create that vibe in Baltimore City and hone that vibe in Baltimore City. So after being there for uh, several years, he decided to go on and become the governor. I said, uh, I'll do my own thing now. <laughs> it was fun. Uh, but uh, he, uh, one of the things that we did announce 
that was one of several projects that we did that I still to this day reflect upon is when we took the city wireless. And if you go back a few years, you know, 2001, this was a big deal to talk about a city thinking about moving its uh, citizens wireless and what does that mean and how can that impact education? How did that enable tourism? How did that enable uh, business development? Uh, so that was a very big uh, deal for us and one of the uh, proud uh, portions of that tenure. All along, I enjoyed talking. I just loved to talk. So while I had all these jobs in the technology field, I ended up always seeming to find my way into being either the corporate spokesperson about technology, the person that was seen as someone that could communicate in layman's terms and break down some of the things that were happening in these complex worlds that we live in. So I decided at some point to try my own radio show. And there's a whole other story behind that, but I'll save that for another day. But uh, in 1999, I had about maybe 20 or so households. It was a very low wattage station. <laughs> Bought my own airtime, and I joked that nobody listened because it was just such a small, uh, small arena. Uh, so you flash, fast forward a little bit uh, to uh, 2007, and I'm actually interviewing people like Sid Meier. So if anyone knows who Sid Meier is, right? But, uh, one of the uh, uh, best creators of, of this time, I guess you could say. If you play the game Civilization and other games of that, that's uh, who Sid Meier is. So nonetheless, nonetheless, you know, we go from, what, 20 households to uh, 17 million or so households with a combination of different programs like Morning Edition, like uh, News and Notes with Farai Chidea, like like uh, my XM uh, Daily Talk Show, and then some of the... Um, television programs that I do for Comcast and other outlets. So it's been a great ride communicating technology. Um, that's kind of been my thing. And then as it relates to gaming, uh, I have always had an interest in gaming, obviously, dating back to when I was a kid. I co-founded a program called the Urban Video Game Academy. It's myself, Joseph Salter, as well as uh, Roderick Woodruff. So the three of us got together and said, hey, there is a problem in the industry. There aren't enough uh, women creating games, designing games, and there sh certainly are not enough minorities uh, developing uh, games in the industry. What is the problem? Well, it's exposure, it's education, it's role models. It's the fact that they don't know that these are even career tracks. The parents don't know that there are degree programs. So how do we put that into a model, make it free to inner city students that want to come and make an after school or summer school uh, program? So we ran this pilot for about three years. Uh, a lot of press, USA Today, CNN, and others, uh, as well as NPR, picked up the story and uh, supported what we were trying to do with the initiative. And it's really, this is really something that's, it, it's not, I want to pause just on this one part. I am trying to be fast for the sake of time. But I do want to pause and take a breath for a second on this one part. Because I think while we talk today about how games can impact education and where that impact uh, is working, where it may not be working, uh, what are the challenges. Uh, one of the things that we are working on, or I'm working on now, is really tying the development cycle of video games, the, the cycle of creating a game, of creating a character, of creating a narrative story, to core academics. So instead of just teaching kids how to develop games, we're more teaching them we're hooking them by something they love to do, and that is to learn and play games. But what we're trying to do is tie that into middle school curriculum so that when we are on a screen that has an X and Y axis or we're on a screen where a wireframe is there before it's a character, we can reinforce geometry and mathematics and physics. Oh, you want to write uh, the objectives and the narrative story? Oh, well, that's creative storytelling. Do you know your sentence structures? Do you? So we're trying to tie in the development process through core academics, and that's where our challenge is right now. And so we're in the process of, of putting those pieces together. And in 2008, um, um, we, we have uh, spun off. The partners are all doing their own things now. And so we're, I'm taking those lessons learned and creating a launch of a new academy in 2008 and um, invite all of those that are interested to understand more about this. It's really an exciting process that we're going through. So that pretty much gives you uh, a background of me outside of radio, TV, and online media. I do, we do have a, a company, I actually run a company called Mario Armstrong Media, and we consult, and we've consulted everyone from 
charter schools in Baltimore City, all the way over to corporate clients like AOL and a variety of, of different initiatives, as well as doing uh, public speaking and events around STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. We do events to really try to spark the interest in our youth to want to go down the innovative path in a unique and different way. So I hope uh, that gives you a quick synopsis of, of, of who I am and what I do. And if, 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 could I take one other quick minute? Did I do pretty good? Minute, sure. Did I do fast? <laughs> All right, because I, I just, uh, just want to, you know, when, when you have an opportunity to speak at MIT, right? This is like the, the intellectual capital of the world as far as, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> if right? If you call it that, you can have two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it's the intellectual capital of the world. So as I travel around and do a lot of public speaking to, to different audiences and age groups and, and so on and so forth, uh, you know, like our company has sat around the table and we started thinking about products that we thought would be neat to bring to market ourselves. So I just want to take this as a market research opportunity real fast, like 30 seconds, to just get your read on whether I'm on to something or if I'm way out in left field here. So we see a lot of kids using the Internet. And, and uh, many of you would say, oh, well, they're playing video games at home. And, uh, you know, there's the outdoor exposure is becoming less and less. So we started thinking about, well, how do we bring sun and excitement back to these kids. So we came up with an idea called the USB uh, PC Tanning Center. <laughs> and, 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 you know, maybe by the time we launch it, it'll be the Firewire PC Tanning Center, but right now it's the USB one. And, and this is a snapshot of what it looks like. <laughs> so, so as you can see, it has two base units here that feature some ultraviolet rays here. And, and we even include, we, we include these uh, little eyeglass things with the package, the, the, the eyeball cover thingies. They, they come with this package. We haven't quite figured out the, okay, I'm just joking. I take it from the laughs that maybe it's not that bad of an idea as a prank, <laughs> prank item, maybe. But, all right, well, thanks so much for your time, and I appreciate being here and look forward to our discussion uh, as it relates to this topic. Thanks again. Thanks. Over to you, Ian. Okay. Well, maybe I can get up on the screen here. Oh, yeah. Those are the, sm the smaller versions of me. Um, okay. Let's see here. Um, my, my name's Ian Bogust. I teach at Georgia Tech, and I run a, a studio, a game studio called Persuasive Games. I'm a, I'm a video game critic and designer, which is a good job to have. Um, I wanted to tell you um, just in a few minutes about what I do, um, and I thought I would do that first um, um, by showing you an example of some of the things um, that, that, that trouble me. Um, so this is um, one of the topics that we might be thinking about uh, lately, uh, oil. We could pick anything else, but um, when I think about the world and um, the complexity of it, um, it strikes me that, uh, that that's a subject we don't uh, treat um, in as much detail as we could. So th think about oil for a minute and just imagine the ways that we might engage it um, in our thinking and our daily practice. I mean, you know, certainly there's topics like geochemistry and seismology and we might want to know where we could go drilling and, you know, what kind of places in the world those mean. But maybe in order to do that, we, we, we should understand something about the, uh, the history of, of conflict in those regions, especially like in the Middle East and Africa where um, where there's uh, considerable amounts of oil. Those happen to be, you know, largely parts of the, the developing world. Or maybe we think about the, the futures markets on which uh, 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 petroleum trades and the relationship between that and global capitalism or between global capitalism and, let's say, ecology, which also seems to have something to do with oil. Um, you know, lo logistics and commerce and, uh, and, and things like uh, the way that we live also seem to be related. In fact, the only reason that we need to drive so much is because of the kind of ways that we dwell, especially in in this country, um, and that brings up questions in my mind like uh, uh, issues of labor. Why, why do we work in the way that we do, and how are our cities planned around that, and how might we be, in fact, healthier if we, um, if we walked or if we uh, built community gardens that didn't rely on transporting our fo food over many thousands of miles um, with petroleum-fueled uh, uh, fleets and, uh, and so forth. And, you know, I live in Atlanta where, uh, where transit is, is, is less of an option, but in fact is deeply related to issues of race and the development of our metropolitan system in the 1960s and 70s was uh, deeply tied to, uh, to race relations or the, or the lack of them. And, you know, th so these are political issues, really. And, and I think that, you know, when we start to kind of think about any kind of topic in the world, um, this is what it ends up looking like, is this complex web of interconnected issues. But, but yet, if I look at the ways that we have chosen to translate uh, media 
and our engagement with the world through media. Um, it doesn't strike me that we're taking advantage of that challenge. Um, so, you know, when we use um, mobile devices um, to send 160 character messages, or, uh, or when we write 20-word um, posts on our blogs, or, um, or, or uh, little insignificant uh, whatevers on Twitter, or two-minute videos that we put on YouTube, um, is that the best way of getting at the, the complexity that I see in, in the world? Um, whereas video games, which, which are a topic uh, of, of, of study um, that, uh, that I think are related uh, to these other media, um, video games of all kinds, in fact, uh, seem to be very good at addressing complexity and complexity of many issues. Uh, and they do this, in my mind, um, by building models um, rather than taking the ways that we communicate, the way that we've, al we've always communicated with, with words or with letters or with images and simply putting those uh, on computers so that we can translate them, uh, transmit them on the internet. Um, video games allow us to build models. Uh, these are a new kind of representation of these things. Uh, and those models make claims about how things work um, or how they might work differently. Uh, and they allow us to have experiences that are constrained by them. Computational representation, when we build models with computer code, are tremendously flexible. And they make it possible for us to model almost anything. Um, theoretically, this is a, a question I've tried to address in my research. Um, this is a recent book on that topic. But it's also something I've tried to address in, in my game design work. Um, the kinds of experiences that we can have uh, constrained uh, by the models that, that we might build around them. And, and I think this goes for a, a wide variety of subjects, like um, why I might or might not want to buy a three-row uh, three seat SUV, or um, what it's like to work uh, and manage a ice cream store, or um, you know, the possible, these are all games uh, that we've made in my studio, um, or the, 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 the pros and cons of using um, wind energy in a community, um, or, or the absurd arbitrary nature of transportation security. Um, <laughs> or um, or what, a, what a, a, a public policy issue, like uh, the recent debate on, uh, on, uh, on visas in immigration, which might feel like, or the relationship between uh, the petroleum industry and, um, and uh, um, uh, natural disaster and so forth, or or um, uh, the politics of nutrition, um, and you know we make we're used to making characters in games. Um, maybe this is a different kind of character than we're used to making in a game um, that we might, you know, put inside of a world and imagine uh, what it might be like to live in that world and make choices about what we eat and what we do, but to have to be able to afford those choices and in fact to be able to uh, to change the uh, uh, the nature of the of the policies under which we live. Um, through subsidy or through regulation, or through being able to afford health care or not, and so forth. So these are some examples of, um, uh, of games and, and what I think the potential is for games to address uh, complexity. Uh, and that's, uh, that's the, the area of intersection that I see between uh, 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 video games and, and civic engagement. Thanks. <laughs> so I'll kind of start out with some, um, some broad questions and uh, try to take us down some, some pathways, but I imagine that we may, um, we may diverge from that as the conversation flows. Um, uh, Mara, you mentioned the, the term uh, using video games or, st or studying video games and making video games to, quote, impact education. Um, your terms, Ian, were things about um, understanding complexity of issues. And you kind of, when you did the oil picture there, there are a lot of different things from history to politics to, to science that you put in there. Um, and so if we think about the use of games beyond entertainment, that doesn't necessarily mean um, that they're not entertaining, because I think that games, probably by definition, we won't get into definitions today, but probably by definition are entertaining. Um, but, but what, what is, what is impacting education? What is understanding these complexities? Um, I, I tossed around some words here. Do we use games to, quote, inform? Is it kind of like understanding some issue at some broad level? Is it to enlighten, to kind of raise awareness of an issue? Or is it really to kind of educate and kind of deliver a particular message? Um, as, as an example of, of, the, of the kind of latter, um, kind of an extreme example, particularly with um, what might be considered civic engagement, we, we had spoken with a group some time ago who had very particular messages that they wanted to deliver through games. They wanted people to be good to their neighbor and, and other kind of messages like that. And their kind of model was somewhat um, antithetical from ours, <laughs> perhaps. But it was like, well, you know, if you do the wrong thing, you should be corrected and kind of pushed back on the right path. 
but there's a lot of people that kind of look at that's the way that you should kind of use games. So how do you, how do you see learning or educating or informing through games? Is, what's, what's the right word that we can kind of be most powerful with this medium? Um, well, first of all, I, I don't think that games have to be fun. Um, <laughs> so so let, let's get that definition out of the way. <laughs> um, and in fact, uh, just as a lead into an answer to, to your question, um, maybe the, the way to think about it is not to think about a way that games might be educational or might engage people or what have you, but to admit that there are probably many possible ways that this could take place. And then in fact, if we've been looking at this medium and imagining that it's this monolith that there's, there's video games, and they're all the same, essentially, right? I mean, you know, one, one video game is the same as the next, um, and you just choose them based on personal preference and, and use them to distract yourself instead of doing your homework or instead of going outside. Um, but we could, we could say that of books, I suppose, too, uh, if, we, if we really wanted to, and uh, I don't think any of us would agree that that's the case. So I think there's, there's something like this spectrum of, of, of possible uses um, and experiences that we could have with video games. The problem is that the, um, the medium, especially the, let's say the last uh, 10 or 15 years of, of the commercial medium, um, haven't given us a, a great uh, uh, perspective on that possibility space, but only, only some very narrow portion of it. So now we're looking for new domains and new terrain, and we're trying to kind of find those open spaces. And then when we find one, we think, oh gosh, like maybe I can do something here, because I'm gonna borrow these you know, conventions from this game and make, and instead of you know, wandering around and, um, and doing favors for other people, now you have to have a, you know, a, a nutritional plan or something. Um, and we're slowly kind of you know, uh, uh, tapping and, 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 and opening up those spaces, um, uh, but in, in, in large part, there's a tremendous amount of work to do. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm suspicious that there's a single, uh, a, a single approach or a single method um, f uh, for learning and games or what have you. Um, even in one particular context, we might find, we might find many of them. Yeah, if, if I had to, uh, I, would, I would support um, some of the points that Ian is saying, but I would m maybe, maybe not necessarily differ. I guess my answer, because I do agree with him that we should be looking at the possibilities, but my answer when I think of that question is they do all of those. They, they do inform, they do enlighten, and they, they do educate. Um, they may do it in a different way, and your intended message may not be always what the received message ends up being. Um, but I, and I, to, to go back to your other point as well about should games be developed with an agenda or, or with a mission in mind? And I think of other games that, like Food Force, uh, that was clearly developed with an agenda in mind of understanding uh, nutrition and poverty. And, and so, I mean, I'm sure there are other games that, and, and there's one, right? I, I just said one game out of, you know, the infinity of, of games that we could uh, recommend or talk about or suggest up here on the panel. I guess my point when it comes to this question of can they be used um, beyond entertainment, uh, I understand that question because largely of the type of people that I'm dealing with are politicians, are uh, educators, are uh, nonprofit uh, executive directors, and, and no offense to any of those uh, folks, uh, Maybe a little of that. <laughs> yeah. Glad he said it. <laughs> um, but but the, the literacy level of how games can be used is not understood by all. And what we have to do, sometimes we're so close to the industry that we forget that. And we, we, we get bogged down in this, oh, this is a great game, and, and this is the mission, and we lead with this, what we want this mission to be first, instead of thinking about the game more openly. And so um, my challenge is educating people that there are reasons to play games beyond entertainment. And I think that is a realistic challenge that people should start having a smarter, uh, more um, engaging and transparent dialogue about. As long as we continue to have uh, politicians across the country uh, who say no, uh, you know, uh, across this nation that um, uh, say no to PlayStation, uh, and, and they really just don't get it, uh, or they read their, their, their staffer's notes, take it from someone that's been inside of, of, of government, they read points off of their staffer's notes, uh, until we start having more meaningful dialogue, um, I think that entertainment question will continue to be asked, because what is covered in the media? What is covered in the media is soundbite culture, what is covered in the media is neg negativity, negativity rules, if it bleeds, it leads, 
All right? I mean, this is the stuff that they say in newsrooms. And so they don't want to talk about um, a force more powerful, you know, a video game about nonviolent struggle. They want to talk about Grand Theft Auto and how that's ruining our kids. And so I, I, I think um, my point is absolutely there is education uh, beyond just the entertainment realm. And the minute we can start having more discussions about serious games or whatever the standardization is on the, on the classification of that category, which I also think is part of an issue, is it an interactive learning experience? Is it a serious game? What is it? Um, that other side of the culture that's developing games for other reasons beyond entertainment is real and needs to have much more uh, communication to everyday folks that are making decisions. Uh, about whether or not these games show up in our, our educational school, school systems or about whether or not these games uh, have any meaningful uh, 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 value when your kid is playing 40 hours of a video game in the household. So I, absolutely, my, my, you know, I'm sorry to sound maybe kind of full circle, but um, I just wanted to point out some examples that I do think that the question is valid and that it can do all of those and more beyond entertainment. Did you, did you well, I mean, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a lot we could say. <laughs> there, there are kind of right. two ways of looking at the intersection of, of video games and politics. One is um, the question, uh, uh, what, in what way can, can video games about political issues um, inform people or engage mm -hmm. them with those issues? Another is to look at the, the way that, um, that politicians use video games um, rhetorically mm -hmm. w without any concern for the content of any individual game. And it's just very convenient. I'm, I mean, right. you know, it's, a, it's, 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 it's such a low-hanging fruit, really, uh, uh, for um, uh, someone seeking elected office uh, to, uh, to point to video games as, as, a, as a kind of values issue, especially, let's say, you're, you're trying to establish yourself as some kind of a centrist, uh, uh, you know, who, who's interested in family values. And, and I'm not going to name names. Uh, you know. <laughs> we know um, who they are. Uh, it, it's very convenient. Um, and there's very little to be lost, really. Uh, at least it would right. seem that way, because the, the, the you know, games are for kids, right? Kids don't vote. Uh, you know, this, these would be the kind of, kind of line of thinking. Um, so if we imagine that there are those two those two camps, um, one of the things that surprised me so much about uh, uh, both the, the kind of game, uh, the game research community and the industry itself is how much uh, we are willing to go ahead and accept the frame of the politicians right. rather than to make our own and to spend a bunch of time trying to defend games and create these or whole organizations around, uh, you know, trying to uh, uh, lobby for, for, for uh, game advocacy and for game players as a kind of demographic group that deserves protection. And I just, I just think that kind of line of thought is totally wrong-headed, um, uh, not in its spirit, but in its strategy. And we should, we should, we should just go after a different frame uh, for the medium and, and as part of that, uh, make new examples of it um, or, or point out the, the existing examples that, that do something different. Uh, that's much harder to argue with. Mm -hmm. so, so you mentioned there that um, games are for kids. Um, and so if we're thinking about an audience who we're, who we're kind of targeting, um, with games for civic engagement, I mean, it seems kids is the kids are, and we can think of kids as, well, I'm, I'm, as I get older, I, kids, get, kids get older, it seems. <laughs> so maybe I'll call kids anything up to 25 at this point. <laughs> um, so is that, is, is that and should that be the target audience? And, and if, if it's not, if, if it's only one among many, how do we break out of that given that there's, that, that is the, or is mm. that the prime video game audience? Right. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, the short, short okay, answer, next question. Short, yeah. answer, <laughs> short answer is no. Um, I mean, the longer answer requires a bit of explanation, I think, um, because we, we, we do have a, a lack of media literacy, um, as you pointed out, around the medium, and also a very short memory, it turns out, a very short cultural memory uh, about it. Um, the, the, the video game as a, as a forum, the computer game, um, when, it, when it first appeared in, in, I mean, commercially in the early 70s, uh, was, was solely for adults. Th these were games you played in, in taverns, uh, and they, they shared much more in common with, with pinball and with darts and with the, that sort of activity uh, than they did with anything else. Uh, and uh, some of those were translated for, for the home uh, by the mid-70s um, with the idea of, of kind of bringing them home, bringing Pong home, and that was where the Atari, um, that was yep. the whole idea behind the Atari uh, was, was taking some of these popular arcade games and making it possible to experience them uh, in the home. I'm, I'm hopeful that we can just turn the rest of our conversation really into a conversation about the Atari, uh, actually. <laughs> I knew that was going to resonate. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you won't believe what I found in there. And uh, <laughs> Actually, I know exactly what you found in there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I'm sure you've taken a few apart. And the, um, 
the, um, the, the, the arcade culture of the early 80s, which had the same kind of, you know, we had the same negative reactions to, oh, it's, uh, 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 you know, destroying youth. Um, in, in fact, one of the first examples of, of video game controversy, um, and now I'm just completely digressing, is uh, uh, in 1976, uh, there was an arcade, uh, well, coin-up game um, called Death Race. Uh, that was uh, kind of loosely based on Death Race 2000, which was a, f a film of sorts, um, <laughs> and uh, and you would it was very crude um, in its in its visual appearance, and you had this sort of car that you could drive over these, uh, I think they were described as, as goblins or ghouls or zombies or something, um, but you drove cars. It was, it was the first game in which you could drive cars over people, <laughs> um, and it was it was tremendously controversial, and it was eventually pulled and. There's a lot we could say about it. So, so in, in that way, that, that kind of transition started to happen even in, even in the mid-70s. Um, but there's a long kind of complicated relationship between the, the, the games industry and, and the toy industry and whether they are or aren't toys and uh, sold at the toy fair but also at the, com at the consumer electronics show. Um, but it's not until the mid-80s. It's, it's really Nintendo's fault that we think that games are for kids because when, when it is, it, when, when they um, resuscitated the market in the mid-80s with, the, with the, the Nintendo Entertainment System, uh, they did so by kind of backdooring into the toy market with this robot and then imposing a, um, a licensing scheme that required uh, published titles to be essentially vetted and approved uh, by them. And there's, there's a tremendous untold history of censorship in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in these games. Uh, well, Nintendo sort of decided, oh, well, no, you can't have that in the game because it's not appropriate for our audience. Um, so, you know, this happened over time, um, but I think what it shows is that, you know, actually if we, if we, if we just think back 30 years, we, we see a medium that was entirely for adults, and now we, we have no memory of that whatsoever. Um, so it's my inclination that we can, we can simply forget, um, we, can, we can dismiss this claim that, that, that video games are, are for kids and instead ask um, what kinds of video games might be useful for different kinds of people in different contexts. I think we'll pick up that thread in a second, but I'll, I'll throw it over to Mario. Do you have anything to add on the? Who's our audience? Um, yeah, I think um, I, I think the approach to that shouldn't be limited by an answer, um, be, because the audience is that widespread. Uh, and if you are to look at any of the, uh, if you follow industry statistics and and believe those sources. Um, you know, they would tell you that the average video game, uh, the average age of a gamer is, what, 30, 33? 33 years old, I believe, is uh, the, the statistic. Um, so that gives you an idea of maybe who the, what the average age of a gamer is. But when you ask me um, who should be playing games, my answer is not the kids, because they're already doing it. My answer is teachers should be playing games. That's, that's what I think, I think of. I think... Um, um, Civic activists should be playing video games. I think uh, church leaders should be playing video games. I think uh, people that run nonprofits that uh, disseminate money around education and poverty and technology strategies should be playing video games. Whether it's someone on your staff that you trust that's younger than you or you just don't have time to do it, so be it. But I think the discussion and gaming shouldn't be seen as just a recreational activity. It should be seen as a time of reflection and study uh, and research and understanding. And there are enough forums, there are enough people doing great things um, to, to have enough of a start, to have people that don't traditionally play games. So I think that's the, to me, that's the audience I try to focus on. Um, I, I watch the kids because I love to watch how they play games. And that gives us fuel to understand how does that um, start to influence uh, civic media? How does that influence um, their citizenship? How does that influence uh, their moral values? And, and so it's, it's great to, to see whether they're on a handheld game that's connected through the internet with playing with people from other cultures uh, or they're playing on a cell phone um, or, or a laptop or, or a console. It's really invigorating to watch that, but I think so many other people aren't seeing the same energy, the same creativity from, quite frankly, kids that we write off, kids that we are willing to just write off. I'm not, you know, many of the many kids play games that have access to them, um, but you'll be surprised at how many kids you may not think have access to a $400 gaming console, and and that trumps everything else in the household, um, believe it or not. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, um, 
when you go through some of the different areas of, of the country and seeing how different kids are interacting with games, it's very interesting. I, I mean, it's, it's, so I think, to answer your question, then we can get into some of those other areas, but uh, to answer your question, I think teachers uh, really should start playing them in nonprofit leaders. And, and if we can get a, if, if someone could help us, maybe Ian and, and maybe we can get MIT to start this, but if we can get like a, uh, a, a congressional land party, <laughs> that would be like, that, that would go a long way. Like, if, if you could, you know, if, if we could just get Congress to stay up late one night and just, and, and maybe we just take it to Capitol Hill and we just do a land party there. <laughs> but, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm joking, right? They, but they at probably the same send time, their staffers. That, but, that's, yeah. but see, that might not be such a bad thing. You know, you said staffers, is that what you said? Yes, I said they would send their staffers oh, to yes. the land party. <laughs> and, yeah, and, and you know, but, but you know, some of those staffers are influential staffers. So, yeah, maybe the, the congresswoman or congressman can't get over there, but maybe they could send their staffer it was, if it was made appealing enough and the message was sent clear enough so that we could start that education process. But those people, I think, are the ones that need to play games. That's who I'm talking about. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, I would just want to follow up because the, the idea of, um, of teachers and, and, and parents and, and people in, yeah, parents, in positions yes. of, of so-called authority yeah. to, uh, to, to become game players is, is really important. And it's not hard to, to convince yourself of this, I think, because we, uh, we you know, when, think about being a parent. Um, you know, you, you uh, might, might read to or with, or with your kids, or you might be concerned about the things that they're reading or, 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 or watching um, at the cinema or on television. And the reason that we can make those judgments, that we, uh, that we can make decisions like, oh, no, I don't, I don't think this movie is right for my class or, or for my child, is because uh, we have tremendous deep literacy in those media and we've watched them, uh, and we've seen a, a vast uh, kind of array of different kinds of films, a, red, a, a, a number of different kinds of books, and understand the conventions, uh, how they work, what it means to go and see something, what a director's work is like compared with someone else's, and so forth. Uh, so the only way to develop that with games is to, is to play them. And there's, there's other benefits that we get that we just don't, we just don't have, and it's, it's the idea of being there on the couch um, uh, or, or next to, next to the, the computer uh, w w with, a, with, a, with anyone, with a child or, or an, older, an older kid who, um, who is having an experience that needs to be worked through in some way. So, I mean, right. if I've got a story, if, if you can indulge me, that's related to this. Um, let's see here. Where is it? Where is it? Okay. I, I went through this very quickly earlier. You guys know this game? Okay, this is Animal Crossing. Um, this is the best game. <laughs> <laughs> End of uh, story. That's it. We can, we can, we can, you can all go. No. Um, uh, this is an amazing, an amazing game. It's, it's a game for the, for the it's a commercial game for the Nintendo, uh, last, last generation Nintendo uh, console, home console, uh, and uh, you run away from home and you go live in Animal Crossing. Uh, so it's already perfect for your kids. <laughs> Um, but the, there, there's a lot of amazing things about the game. Uh, but the first thing you do when you arrive in town is um, you, uh, you get a mortgage uh, because you don't have any money and you don't have anywhere to live uh, and you meet Tom Nook, the raccoon, real estate tycoon of Animal Crossing. <laughs> he says, no problem, you know, so don't worry about it. Um, I've got some huts here, some little shacks. You know, just pick one. You can come work for me uh, and you can pay it off. Um, and so uh, you, get, you get a house, and then, and then you've got to pay it off. It's a tremendous amount of money, and you do that by selling fish that you catch or doing favors for other people and, and so forth. And eventually, after you pay off your mortgage, he offers you upgrades. So you, you see the, the, the two-story house here. Uh, I mean, you know, why not, why not expand, really? Uh, um, so uh, we, we've, probably, we've played hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of this game in my house. Everybody can have their own character inside the game in, in the same world. And one day when, when uh, my son was five... He came to me uh, uh, just sometime, you know, random time during the day. He said, Dad, I have, a, I have a problem. And I, you know, he was five. He was just starting to be at the point where he would, you know, kind of come and talk to me about, uh, about such things. So I thought, this is great. I, you know, kind of puffed up my chest. <laughs> <laughs> yes, son. Right. <laughs> um, well, Dad, he said, um, I, I can't even... I, don't, I can't even walk around in my house anymore. I, I have, because, you know, I, I bought that, that fruit couch. <laughs> and, and you remember I got all those shirts, and there's that lunar rock that you sent me. And, 
you know, so the house that you get when you first start is very small, and you can buy things to customize your environment, right? Because who wouldn't want to customize their house? Um, I can't. I don't even have anywhere to move around in my house, but I, I need more space. Um, so I need I need to get a bigger house. But the problem is that and this is my son. You know, the problem is I spent all my money buying stuff. <laughs> I don't have any. I don't have any money left to pay my mortgage. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> so there you go. Um, so what'd you say, Dad? So, so we sat down and we talked about long-term debt, you know, and <laughs> and he said, "Oh yeah, that makes sense." And uh, and you know, he thinks credit cards are evil now, and he's, he's sort of. And we even, we even talked about compounding interest, and he was horrified. Because you know? <laughs> there's no compounding interest in Animal Crossing, at least. Uh, were, you, were you able to make an analogy and say, and that's why we have to sell your Nintendo? <laughs> <laughs> uh, time to simplify. Yeah, we, we've got, um, in my house, we've got uh, throwaway day. Every, you know, some people do spring cleaning. We do throwaway day. Throwaway. Um, and it's inspired in part by, uh, by Animal Crossing. <laughs> we just try to divest ourselves of all the objects that we, that we don't have. But this is interesting, right? Because all of this media that, that asks us to uh, customize something, right? Oh, make it yours and express yourself by having a pink phone and all that's kind of nonsense about that we're, where commercialization mm -hmm. is the way that we, uh, that we become people. Um, you know, th this game, which, which appears to endorse that, is really, is really much more com complicated. Uh, and, and my son saw right through it in some ways. Uh, he was five. It was, it was fairly disturbing. Um, so, yeah, this is a story about why you might want to play games with your kids so that you can, you know, or, or with your students or whatever. Um, so when these experiences come up, um, you know, they need to be worked through. Excellent. Um, so I, I'll actually kind of take that point of, uh, of your interaction with your son there. Um, in the Animal Crossing is pretty open-ended. You can make lots of different choices, and, and you kind of insinuate that there's certain things that you like to do. You like to decorate your house. You like to upgrade. But different people play it in lots of different ways. Um, and it's kind of a, a characteristic of a, of, a, of a suite of, of a kind of game where you have lots of different choices that you can make, some of which are, some of which you value, some of which other people might value. And the game may, may or may not kind of enforce those, kind of give you feedback on those, whether those were good choices or not. Mm -hmm. So in games that let you make kind of wrong choices, I mean, I guess the classic one that's, that's, cited, that's already been, um, that's been cited once is Grand Theft Auto. You can, you can make choices in Grand Theft Auto, many of which are bad choices. <laughs> And there may, not, may or may not be consequences to those. In, the, in this case here, your, your son kind of made some maybe bad choices, and you were there to kind of help him, guide him, and point him in a positive direction and teach him about compound interest. Um, so but what, what is kind of the role of games in sort of being, should they be open-ended and, and allow you to make these wrong choices? Should they kind of correct you back in the right direction? Um, how how open-ended should they be when you're allowed to make these uh, kind of choices and, 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 and re perhaps reinforce what may be conceived as negative behaviors. Right. Um, OK, so there's a, there's a number of ways to answer that question. Um, I mean, I think there are, two things, there are two things about games that I think are very powerful representationally. One is this model building idea that you can construct a, a model of how something works. And it's always a claim about how something works, somebody's idea of how some system works. It might be a social system, might be a mechanical system, but it's how something works, like in this case, how uh, how long-term debt works, and you can interact with that, and their world is constrained by that interaction. And the second is um, uh, uh, taking on a role, um, and that role might be, um, you know, the the space marine, or that role might be the um, the taxpayer, or what, or what have you. Um, and so, by 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 not just living someone else's life for for a brief moment, but li living a life that's constrained by a particular situation, uh, we can gain insights into what it might be like to, to be in that situation. And there's, uh, I think, a, a tremendous amount of empathy to be gained, wh whether or not the situation is desirable. So a game like Grand Theft Auto actually is a pretty interesting view into um, the, you know, the experience of the, 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 the sociopath or, 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 or the idea that there are, there, are, um, <laughs> you know, there are consequences to criminal behavior. I don't think this is really what the game is about, but it's also, it's also um, <laughs> Uh, it, it does give the, the player interesting choices to make in those contexts. Um, but this, this is maybe not, maybe not the best example of, of a game um, uh, 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 for, for kids, uh, for example. We wouldn't give this to our kids and say, well, you know, go learn about uh, why you might not want to um, you know, fire on the police. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, so so there, there are also, also contexts uh, context for them. 
Um, but, but one thing I hear a lot uh, that, I, that I don't believe is that uh, you know, what, what video games should do or what their power is is letting people kind of construct their own worlds um, and then they can, they can kind of make these environments that where they're being creative or, or something. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but I think it's, it's the opposite thing that interests me, the idea of living in a world you, you don't construct that isn't one that you would choose and, and understanding um, someone else's perspective. Uh, I think that's really powerful. Yeah. Um, at, when it, at, to piggyback off of that, I think one of the things that comes to mind when you when you look at a game, you know, one of the one of the things that you're thinking about in the design process, right, are are, are the outcomes, the, the the challenges, and and the rewards, and and whether or not you know, some people will say, oh well, you know, video games teach competition, and and but it's really interesting because if you think back, uh, I want to say it was um, uh, Macropolis. Uh, 84, 1984, uh, Will Wright, and then um, uh, that which became SimCity, uh, really didn't have a winner or a loser. And it was like, that was one of the first times where you kind of witnessed a game that if you won if you won. <laughs> you know, it, it was up to you as a player to kind of win. It really wasn't up to whether or not you scored or, or racked up all of these points or made all of this money. And that was a whole, that was a, a mind shift at that point of, what the end product of a game can be and how I can engage in a game. Wait, I can play a game and it not have to end this way? I don't, I, I don't have to just be a loser or a winner? Um, I don't know if some of you had a chance to play um, uh, Fable uh, when it was out on, on the Xbox, but that, that was uh, similar in that uh, you know, you're in this little town and you can make these good decisions or you could make these bad decisions. And you know, as you made bad decisions, you became more and more evil. And as you became uh, made good decisions, uh, you become uh, you would have more and more rewards. Theoretically, uh, the game was really kind of simple to play, but the fact that it was giving kids an option other than just you win or lose made you think differently about playing the game. And I remember um, I don't remember recall exactly who wrote these books, but I remember my mom giving me books when I was young uh, that were like mystery books that if you uh, read a page and you chose an answer at the end of that page, you would flip to a different chapter. Can, can anyone help me out? What, what Choose your called? own adventure. <laughs> <laughs> Let's all do that one more time for Mario. <laughs> Choose your own adventure. All right, thank you. <laughs> and I, I'm glad to hear that a lot of people knew what I'm talking about. But that's, that's kind of, to make you kind of reflect on something that hopefully that you, you can gravitate to that. If you've been through that experience, then you now know what we're talking about when we talk about the ability to make choices. And you know what's funny about that? I don't know about you, but I've read, I've read all the options. I did everything, right? I, don't, I, I said, okay, well, I'll answer it this way and go this way, and then I would read the book again, and then I would read it again, and I would choose. So what am I doing? I'm learning, I'm, I'm curious. I'm going through these complex uh, um, um, worlds in video games. So. Um, I, you know, I just think that uh, uh, it, it's, we're at this great time now where we're starting to see more and more people that are in developing power create games that don't really uh, go off of the standard of you win or lose. And so when we start talking about what are the education, what's the educational value, what can we learn, uh, clearly you heard, I mean, that was a loss, right? I mean, he lost his house. So, I mean, <laughs> there's no question that that is an L uh, in the, L, in the uh, L column. But at the same time, it's a win uh, because of the discussion that took place between, between parent and child. And so as games become more, right now we're like pushing games to people. And, and as games really more adapt to, to who we are, our characteristics, our personalities. Uh, I think it'll start to see more of that, um, uh, where am I, I'm digressing a little bit, but I, uh, more of that re response in terms of the rewards and, wh and what those rewards may or may not be, as opposed to rewards that are dictated by the game designer, they now can be dictated by the game player. Well, you know, the, 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 the problem of, um, of doing, um, doing things in a game that we that are undesirable, socially undesirable, um, or, or what have you, uh, it, it's been a real problem for me uh, as a designer dealing with um, with publishers and, and whatnot, doing the kinds of I can imagine. the kinds of games uh, that we do. I was looking for for an example, um, which I, I can't find uh, easily. But um, the the idea that uh, when you when you perform an action in a game, it's it's not not real. Uh, it's it's representational, and the, the decision that you're making is a decision framed within this possibility space of experimentation. 
Um, so you might make a choice that you know is, um, is not a choice you would make um, uh, in your own life, or, or you play a role that is not one you would, you would play in your own life in order to see, uh, see something from a different perspective. And, and I've had this many, many times um, backfire in, in designs. Um, so uh, just one example. Uh, this is a fear, in other words. This is a fear of, of, um, of representing things that, that might seem un undesirable. So we were doing this, this, uh, this game at the studio recently for a major, uh, that published, it eventually got published on a, um, I guess what I'll describe as a, a ma major online news media organization. <laughs> <laughs> you can guess what it might be. Hint, I live in Atlanta. Um, and uh, it was a game about uh, uh, wildlife tra trafficking, uh, which is an interesting topic. Uh, really interesting idea and uh, interesting problem because there's sort of these ambiguities of, uh, not, there's a lot of moral ambiguity. You know, it's easy to say, well, uh, trafficking illegal animals is wrong. Uh, but then when you're in situations as a trafficker where you've got a family to feed and, and, um, uh, and there are other kinds of political and social situations up for grabs, then you know, the, the, the grayness of that decision uh, stands out. Um, and this game uh, initially uh, expressed that and then slowly, 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 slowly didn't as we moved further and further and further into the process. Um, and eventually when it was released, you can, you can, find, it, um, you can find it online. Um, it was uh, essentially almost just, uh, just as if the uh, the idea was inspiring some sort of experience that would be on a web page, uh, you know, so it could be sticky or something, uh, which is too bad. It's really unfortunate. There's a lot of, a lot of examples of this. Um, I mean, maybe, maybe I, we can move on, or I could, I could. Sure. Yeah. So I think we're yeah, we're, okay. we're, we're nearing our halfway point, and I want to turn it over to the audience, shortly. Um, uh, we discussed uh, uh, briefly in, a, in our conversation about. What would qualify as, as you, know, you, you make games and you kind of deal with kids and kind of um, helping them make games and learn? What, what, how do we measure our success in these cases? Um, you know, what are, whether, it's, whether it's quantitative measures or just kind of things that we get as feedback that we know that we're kind of, we're, we're successful in delivering our message or educating our audience. I'll, I don't know if you want to go first, Mario. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can, I, I'm, not, I'm not the academic. Um, in, in that in that uh, in that traditional uh, regard in terms of, of my learning but I can say um, anecdotally with the program that we did specifically in watching kids uh, develop games or want to play games and, and want to actually pursue learning around games um, there was immense anecdotal evidence about the power of the medium uh, we're, we're talking about kids that are in underserved areas that don't have all the means that many other folks do, and yet and still their uh, desire and their passion for learning was off the charts. When there was something relevant that could tie into the process of why they need to know an integer, the process of why they need to know what the x and y axis is, and, 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 and this thing called the plane. And if they want to move an object across the screen, that's called animation that involves physics. And so um, it, was, it was startling because we had, we, we didn't go to uh, areas and say, um, hey kids, uh, you know, join this program and you're gonna become a video game developer. That, that wasn't what we said. I mean, we just said, come to this program if you want to, if you want to. And, and so we ended up having some kids that came to the program because they wanted to, but then we had a body of kids that were forced to come. And that was the most interesting dynamic because kids that want to be there, as we all know, are di totally different than the kids that feel like this is a waste of their time. So when we started seeing the mind shift in students that felt initially that this was going to be a total waste of time, especially girls, especially girls, the word video game locks them up. All, I mean, for, for the girls that we experience. I know that there's plenty of women that are in the games industry and it doesn't lock them up. But for, for these girls, a lot of them, they saw it as, oh, that's something my brother does. Uh, that's something my uncle does. You know, I don't play games. But the minute you start telling them you could create your own character, what would it be? Or you could create your own storyline, what would it be? It's a whole different discussion. And so when you um, put these kids into those environments, anecdotally, my, my feedback from that experience, I mean, we have surveys that we did, and uh, we're, we're working with the university partners now to try to really get 
the, you know, that quantitative, that real third party research to come in and support some of the anecdotal things that we, we've seen. But clearly, kids are soaking up this medium and they want to do more with it. They want to learn with it. They want to express themselves through it. They want to change society by using it. And that's a major, major statement. Um, so uh, anecdotally, uh, video games and education and, and video games uh, from what we've seen from the kids uh, is, is just, you know, I mean, we have kids now saying, uh, Mr. Armstrong, when, when are you coming back? You know, and, and so it's hard now because what's to leave behind? How, how do we follow that momentum? How do we continue to, to make that kid continue to progress on? And so um, I, don't, I get caught up with a little bit when I talk about those experiences because there was a lot of, of blood, sweat, and tears to, to make that program happen off of, a, off of a light bulb that we thought would work coming out of the, the video game conference at E3. And, and that's probably, to me, the best testament of this medium is on to something if it decides to have a, a, an, an obligation beyond the entertainment realm. And it would help if, you know, people like the ESA, I'm sorry, did I, I didn't mean to call out the Entertainment Software <laughs> Association, but uh, I just did. If they could uh, take a moral obligation like other media uh, uh, does with uh, video games, we might uh, see a little bit more increase. But that's my, we'll save that for the Q&A, but that's my anecdotal evidence of, of what I've seen in the classroom. Yeah, I mean, um, certainly w w watching people um, listening more than watching um, players after they've played a game and uh, trying to understand the way that they are um, framing conversations about uh, the topics that might have been at work. I mean, the, the example of long-term debt is one, but there's plenty of others I found in my work. One, one of the stories I like to tell is during the, the Dean campaign um, four years ago, uh, when, when we did this, uh, this video game, um, uh, we, th which was the first, uh, the first official presidential candidate video game, right, uh, at the time. Um, had a lot of problems. Uh, but one of, the, one of the things that came out of, of, of uh, watching people play, which we could do online, or they, they talked about it on, 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 on the, the blogs and the other websites and things, um, was this was a game about grassroots outreach, because that was what the Dean campaign was about. And uh, there was this, uh, this backlash of, of kind of requests. Okay, well, all this shows is that uh, uh, is, a, is a way to campaign. Um, give me something. Give me something about policy. Uh, t talk to me about, about wh what you're about as a candidate. Um, or why can't I just change the names of the signs, you know, to Kucinich or anyone else <laughs> of my choosing? Isn't it the same game, really? Um, and so I, I thought that was very interesting. And I collected um, all, of these, uh, all of these conversations. There were dozens of them. Uh, and sent them up to Burlington. December 2003 and said, okay, here you go. Here's the, this is the, the, the next stage of, of your campaign right here is uh, um, very quickly before Iowa talking about uh, um, the platform. And they said, no, 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 we just need more people. We just need more people. Um, so, so we make the claim at, 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 at my, my studio that we foresaw the downfall of the, of the Dean <laughs> campaign a month before they did. Um, you know, and there's stuff like that. So there, I think there are uh, ways of watching discourse um, and I'm not interested in anything um, numerical here. I'm interested in, in seeing the ways that people engage with problems. But, but that said, I'm, I'm also a pretty patient person. And I, I, I don't believe that we're going to see this medium cash itself out right away. Um, I think that, that video games are a, a type of human expression. And like other kinds of human expression, um, they're going to find their place uh, in history. And, when we, when we read uh, poetry or we watch films that have been made either recently or, or, or very long ago, um, they speak to us in ways that, 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 that the creators couldn't have known. Um, so I'm willing to, to, to wait this out and, and imagine that what I'm doing, I'm doing because it's important to me and might be important later to others. All right, did you have one more thing you want to say before I turn over to the audience? Or? No, I'm fine. Thanks. Okay, so I'll, um, I'll open it up to, to questions from the audience. Do we have a, a mic person? Or I guess we have mics on either side, so here we go. Uh, I'm Rob Darty, gamer, uh, National League Tekken player. It's just a kind of fanatical thing. I've never <laughs> been able to let go since Tekken 2. But um, uh, one of the things that I was really interested in with that you were talking about is obviously the concept of games not having to be fun. Um, specifically, I don't know if you guys played Final Fantasy Tactics, PlayStation 1. Ever. Okay, it's basically just chess except on more levels. And uh, it's a game that no one ever really seems to enjoy but they still play for 120 hours right. per each game because it's so much about um, uh, building up 
you know, the abilities of your characters and being able to tackle other challenges and things like that, and this perfectionism thing, but you can never complete it. So completionists will play this game for hundreds of hours and never get to the point where it's ever really done. Um, and then on top of that, the concept of, um, as games have gotten to the point where it, it's no longer the same sort of technological adolescence as like cinema at the beginning was very gimmicky. Um, now games are starting to branch out to becoming more of an art form. Um, and the ways that people teach things may be very different than you know we would normally expect. Like even something like Grand Theft Auto, um, which people just are ready to harp on at all times, teaches things like resource management. And I mean, the concept of passive income was a totally foreign concept to me until Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> I would never have learned about that economic passive concept income. in education <laughs> in school with the exception of Grand Theft Auto. That just kind of happened. Um, but there are two specific games I wanted to talk to you about. Um, they tie into the whole fable concept of um, playing through a game for different reasons, and if you're a good character, good things happen, bad things. Um, there was an old series about 10 years ago came out for PC called Fallout. Um, the whole concept is um, post-nuclear holocaust uh, RPG where you make different decisions. Some of them are for the good of people, some are for the bad of people, but the storyline changes depending on what happens with that. Um, and they're releasing a new version of that for PS3 and Xbox and everything, the new generation of games next year. Um, but it was really interesting that the first game that I ever played like that that introduced the concept of karma and good decisions changing the world around you versus bad decisions changing the world, world around you, I feel like that's more impactful than watching it on a movie. Like, for example, Syriana was a movie about oil and all the negative things that happened with it. But it's not as engaging as when you're a part of it. Um, and there's also another game called Army of Two, which is the other game I wanted to talk about, which is all about private military corporations and um, the concept that in one board you may be trying to protect people because that's what people are paying for, but the next highest bidder in the next board, you have to assassinate the people you were just protecting. And all of the, the aspects of that where you just go for the highest bidder, it brings a lot of social concepts to light. So the thing I'm trying to tie together with these is how do you imagine games as they elevate to becoming more of an art form impacting the next generation of gamers um, and using that art form to try and bridge out and create and stir up thought within the gaming community instead of just this is the boundaries that we've set up for you as a world to work within, and then what can you achieve within that? Um, yeah, I mean, these are great examples of, of ways that the, um, the commercial industry, even in the last year, has, has been moving in, in these directions. There's a risk, though, that some of these, some of these examples, not necessarily the ones that you cited, um, um, are, are kind of, kind of, you know, s simulations of, of of real ethical or moral dilemmas um, rather than, than than engagement. I've always had a problem with the sort of karma mechanic because, <laughs> I mean, m m moral questions are not globalized. You know, they're right. they're, they're, they're personal in, in, in some way. But um, but your question, you know, is very very big. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and and you know the, the, the there's there's I mean any answer would be speculative. Um, for, for my part, what, what I've chosen to do is to uh, completely ignore and, and deny the idea of the gamer. Okay. I just refuse <laughs> to believe it. There are not gamers. There are people who might play games sometimes, um, but there are not gamers. And I think the, the quicker we, we, we just stop using that frame to talk about this medium, the, the better off we will be. Yeah, I mean, um, it's, to back up Ian on that point, I, I, you know, all you have to do is look at, say, uh, Nintendo and look at the um, explosion behind the Wii, their, their latest console, that really, if you look at the design of that, has everyone, is it safe to say everyone here has seen an ad or a promotion or something about that? Okay, so you, you know how it kind of works and that it's different in its approach to how you play a game. And, and I, I say that to say that they think of people as players, uh, not necessarily as gamers, to, to go to the one, com one comment that you make. I do think it's, um, you know, you raise this really interesting question about karma and about decisions that you can make in a game that can uh, impact the world uh, or impact others. I mean, I even think of, uh, I even think of WoW and some, some right. other games um, that kind of go along those same lines. Um, and I do think that there, there, there are things that you can learn, obviously, uh, within that, that process. But where things... Down the road, uh, you know, uh, as it gets more graphically intense and, and more um, and just intense overall, and then you have high definition, and then you have the whole uh, a thought process of, of, of you know, um, Web 2.0, and people want to collaborate and do more and participate, and how that may start to evolve in games. Um, I would totally be speculating on where I would see it going as well, but I can say that people want that to happen, and they, it seems that way, that consumers want that to happen and want to go down that path. 
Um, so I think you raise you, you raise some some really thought provoking uh, points. I don't have more of a definitive answer for you, but um, something that we continue to need to follow certainly because those are major points that you raised. Thank you. Uh, we have we have long queues on each side, so I'll just ask the speakers to, to who are going to ask questions to be as succinct as you can in your in your questions. I'm interested in a very specific use of games with adults working with young people. And that's where uh, adults help young people navigate mm, typically bureaucratic institutions by making a comparison to games. So for example, the college application game. And it, uh, at times that can sort of bend, <laughs> it can kind of bend towards a, a more crass definition of game where gaming the system is, you're sort of like hacking the system or something like that. But it can be very effective for teaching students to be strategic inside of those institutions. The concern I have, and I wonder about your experiences, maybe Mario speaking to your experience with young people, how do you help them be strategic inside of that, using that game analogy strategically without stopping them from their natural impulse to question the efficacy of those kinds of institutions, stopping them from, you know, I worry that we might be deteriorating their ability to question or have a reformist approach because hmm. they're always gaming the system. Hmm. Um, one, one thought to that would be, um, you know, it's interesting. We didn't do that um, in our program, so it's hard for me to really, you know, understand that because, I mean, I understand what, you, what you're saying and what you're asking, but we didn't do that in our program. In fact, we, we, we kind of did the exact opposite. We, we took kids and um, had, had them reflect on part of what we did that I think helps to answer this question is we had them reflect on the images that video games represent of them. Um, and that was... Uh, um, a different way for them to finally actually question themselves and question the process. So we wanted their curiosity to come out. We, we didn't stifle it uh, as much as uh, you know, I hope we did, and it, it didn't seem, seem that way. So um, I don't know if I'm the best one to answer that question because we didn't really have that type of experience, which is, which is a good situation to be in, but maybe Ian. I mean, you have you, have you read uh, Mackenzie Wark's book, Game, Gamer Theory? Okay, you should you should probably read it um, because he, he makes uh, he makes a, a similar kind of point. You know that the uh, one thing that, that that games do is show show us how the whole world has become kind of a game uh, that we, we where we try to maximize resources and things like that. Um, and uh, but I think I think you know since I believe in representation, I'm one of the few people left who seems to um, that when we when we frame um, processes. As games, we when we when we abstract them to the level of representation, we also show, um, or we have the, the potential to show, the arbitrariness of those processes, mm -hmm. or 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 the way that they're connected to particular um, historically or culturally uh, contingent um, uh, scenarios that would would then um, uh, lead us to moments of, of possible questioning and reform. Uh, uh, but it is it is certainly possible just to accept the game um, and and to take it at face value. This is this is one of the points that, that Ken makes and in the book, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely worth a read. Thanks. Over to this side. Hi, um, so Ian, in the, uh, uh, in the example that you gave with your son in Animal yeah. Crossing, uh, obviously, you know, in that particular situation, it was your input that helped your son reflect upon what was going on. He probably couldn't have looked inside himself and learned about compound interest uh, or anything <laughs> like that. Um, you underestimate his kid. Yeah, maybe I do. He is five. I, okay, really. Uh, <laughs> so um, when, you're, when you're building a model, uh, obviously not everybody has access to a mentor who can you know, help them walk through the model and sort of think critically about it. When you're building a model, how do you build a model that encourages that kind of self uh, that sort of self-reflection, that self-criticism. It's very easy to build a model that you learn nothing from. Here's this system, I poke it, it responds in these ways and I have no idea why. Um, how do you keep it engaging and, uh, and sort of bake that into the presentation of the model? Right, yeah, that's a great question. Um, the, uh, I think that there's probably not one strategy, uh, but the, the idea of um, providing feedback in, in games or in software in, in general has usually been a question of, of efficiency, right? We ask, how can we make sure that the user knows what to do next and it's clear that this button does this thing or what have you? 
in fact, there's a there's a there's a joke. This is nothing to do with the topic. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's a joke um, about uh, uh, HCI uh, that game designers tell about human computer interaction. I apologize if there are any HCI researchers or professionals in the room. Um, and and the story, it's something like goes goes something like this. You know, if 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 uh, if if game design was left left up to HCI, then all games would have uh, a button that said "Press button to win." <laughs> <laughs> that one's yours. You can you can use that one. That's a, that's a, it's a good one to have in your pocket. Anyway, um, you know, so so we're we're not doing that when we when we design these systems that have many possible outcomes, but yet we have to leave traces of uh, of the outcomes that have occurred. Uh, and I think the question you asked is a, is a is really an untapped. It's an untapped design challenge because what we're looking for is not. Um, the maximization of a particular kind of resource, nor the kind of free movement, do whatever you want, right? You can do whatever, it's fine, you know? But rather, um, a recognition that, that choices matter, and when, when choices take place, um, we have to give, we have to provide feedback for what's happened. So when we were working on this Fat World game, which is the, the politics of nutrition game, which is based, I mean, significantly stolen concepts from Animal Crossing there, you know, we've got this world, and we, we asked this exact question, um, and uh, we decided that we would um, that we would build the um, the feedback into the social model that we wanted to represent. So, for example, let's say that you want to know how, what your health is like, because how else can you know if the decisions you're making, you know, the, the nutritional decisions you're making, constrained by your income based on your social class, are cashing out? Um, and but the problem is that if you can't afford to get the health care, then you can never know anyway. Um, and so, so that's a model that's in there. Um, although if you're, if you're wealthy, then, then you can, actually you can go and just do whatever you want because the way that you vote in fat world is with money, basically. Um, so, so it's a perspective that you could see from multiple places. And then we've tried to, we've tried to build a model so that, um, that users will have a reason to go and look at it from multiple different perspectives. I don't know if it's gonna work or not, but, but what we've, we've had a go at it at least. Henry? Okay, I wanted to pull us more deeply into the space of civic engagement. We've talked a lot here about games, less about civic engagement. So two questions that I think are interconnected. One sort of plays to Ian's card, the other to Mario's. On Ian's side, there hasn't been a lot of follow-ups on the Howard Dean game in the selection. We've seen more creative uses of MySpace and social networks, more creative use by YouTube by the candidates. So mm -hmm. it invites us to think about what are the affordances of games uh, mm -hmm. for various kinds of political processes? How do we read games against other kinds of civic media and other ways of communicating ideas to the public? On Mario's side, I, I see it, the Urban Games Academy was pushing in part to diversify the games industry. So what perspectives are we not hearing because the games that are currently exist reflect the viewpoints of particular segments of the population? Mm -hmm. So how does it matter, why does it matter who has access to the ability to create games that might engage us with the political process? Or what are the consequences of a world where some people have the ability to express their ideas through games and others don't? So I, I just throw those open as a ways of getting us to think about the civic engagement part of our topic a bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, go ahead. Um, as it, as it uh, relates to, um, I mean, s some of the startling statistics, if you don't know, um, survey was done by uh, the International Game Developers Association about uh, diversity uh, in the industry. And what you see is that there is less than 10% female, there is about 2.1% African American, and 2.3% uh, Hispanic. Um, and uh, I'm running a blank on some of the other uh, stats right now. But that, that kind of gives you an, an understanding of the picture. Um, and we're talking about what, an $11 billion or more industry. So when we talk about uh, how that impacts the discussion or how that impacts the development of games, I mean, one can point to, and I don't like to always use this example, but it, it is probably one of the best, if not the best, uh, but it wasn't designed this way with, with this question to answer. And that is uh, when you look at the team that developed The Sims and you look at the game The Sims and how popular it is. But if you look at the um, creativity behind The Sims, the demographics of that creativity, you'll see a very diverse team, um, more diverse than what you may see in, in many other places. And, and you start to wonder why, well, why is that you know, the number one selling game or why is that so successful? Is it just because it was a great game 
or was there really something there in the diversity of the perceptions, the diversity of experiences, and the diversity of the backgrounds that made that game really successful? And when you start to look at that in terms of a um, political discussion or uh, civic engagement, um, first off, you know, kids need to feel that they have a voice. Um, and I think games allows them to feel that they do have a voice. And when we put kids in the Urban Video Game Academy and said, create your own game, you, we came, they would come up with, you know, they didn't come up with games that you would expect. You, you may, some of our preconceived notions were, oh, it'll be about music. Or it'll be about, um, I don't know, uh, commercialization, buying clothes or, or fashion or the latest gear. And yeah, there, was, there were some of those. But more and more what we saw were games that were about how to, um, how to um, not be, how to impact poverty. We saw games that were developed about how to clean up the trash in my neighborhood. Um, we saw games that were developed about whether or not do we make a decision to buy food or pay the electric bill. So, I mean, th these were very, th these, they internalized their experiences, their thoughts, their backgrounds, and wanted to put that into a simulation of some sort and be able to try to master this complex world. So if you think about that and you start to uh, talk about politics and, and, and civic engagement in general, you can see clearly that kids want to talk about issues that are affecting them. And they may or may not just have the wherewithal to have those discussions, but games creates a platform that they can relate to, that they can have this discussion in a surprising way. I mean, when you sit down with them and discuss the narrative and the story, well, what do you mean by this? What are the challenges? What would be the outcomes? What would be the rewards? You really start to see a different student. It's amazing. So I think, um, to, to answer your question, I, I think uh, it's a powerful way of shaping at least uh, their exposure to making an impact to society and, and, ha and all the different ways that they could make that impact to society through games. Are you ready? <laughs> yeah, I, I was just, I was Didn't queuing up some uh, visual <laughs> and I kinda uh, just dropped visual like aids dead short right there. Uh, for my response. Oh, yeah, sure. um, so um, I, I remember in 2004 um, in an interview of some kind, um, making the prediction that in the 2008 election, every major candidate would have their own PlayStation 3 game. <laughs> that was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, PlayStation. And I think one of the reasons why, I mean, part, part of it is that uh, we've gotten, we've, we've become distracted, and I'll, I'll use that word, distracted, by, um, by other trends in, in computer technology, including um, um, social media and, uh, and online video and, and, and so forth. Um, but uh, I also suspect that part of the problem is the attempt to go to the source, the attempt to do this in an official way. Um, uh, so this is a, a complex topic, but in some ways the idea of dealing with politics with the politicians in the way that I think games have the power to deal with politics, which is <laughs> exactly to show what the public policy problems are at work rather than the campaign problems that are covering up the public policy problems. Um, how do we do that while we are still um, engaged directly with, with the organizations or the, camp or, or the campaigns? And if I can get my, um, my screen up here. I've also, um, you know, so, so as a response to that, one of the things I started to do was look at the news media as, as a one, one outlet for this. And we, st we started working on this idea of, of news games, these sort of small um, games that are, that are like, uh, it's just black right now, so th that's by design. <laughs> uh, um, these small games that uh, that uh, deal with with, with with current events and um, and and that too ha has posed problems. You know, so the objects that appear in the of the objects that appear in the in the airport security game. Um, this is just a, a random slide I picked. The thing that the arrow's pointing to, by the way, is is, is pressurized cheese. And and you may not know this, but if you go to the TSA's website and look for a list of prohibited items, pressurized cheese is on the list. <laughs> The, the object below it in, is, is hummus, by the way. <laughs> you know, is it a gel? Um, it's from the Middle East? I don't know. Anyway. So, you know, this is a published game, and, and millions of people have played it, but this is an object that did not appear in the game that was originally designed to, uh, and there are a lot of reasons for this. 
Um, and this is a game that was never published on the New York Times. Um, so there are, um, there are challenges. Um, there are challenges dealing with, uh, with the structures, the, 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 the structures of, 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 of the news media and the structures of, um, of, uh, of the political media that I suspect we have to go around to some extent. There's, good, there's kind of a, my, so I guess my answer, Henry, is we gotta go punk rock. We, we have to just do this and not ask for permission anymore and not ask for endorsement anymore, which means finding ways uh, to make that happen uh, uh, financially, having the time, all those sorts of things. I'm here from the Museum of Science and one of the things that I do is introduce people to new science and technology and what we've been doing lately is showing people Second Life and mm -hmm. other you know, online worlds. And I've had the experience of just a couple days ago, I had a, maybe a 75 year old guy who'd never played video games before, saw Second Life on the big screen and said, how do I get this? I want this. I've had little kids say, I can make money in this game. <laughs> <laughs> and there are games you mentioned The Sims. People know about Brain Age and the Wii and yeah. other such things that they really get visceral reactions from people. People who don't play games want these things. And you've been talking about some of the kind of components of those things. I'm curious about what you think some of the other ones are. But the, I think that the real basic question I have is if you had your congressional land party, what would you play? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, a first-person shooter. No. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. We're gonna see it. We're gonna see it tomorrow. Frag your congressman. Yeah. Yes. It would go over so well. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> I, I would probably, um, you know, part of me wants to go punk rock. Part of me wants to go with, all right. We have to play something that they'll understand. And so part of me says, if we have the staffers, we'd go punk rock. And we play something really neat and cool and, and engaging. We might play something like, uh, we might play something like um, uh, Force More Powerful, which might, by the way, we might play with uh, some, uh, a congressman as well. Uh, it's a, a, a game about nonviolent non strategy. How do you, it's a simulation. Um, and it walks you through about 10 different scenarios and you are a chief strategist, and you have to learn all these variables and understand uh, things that come out of city council, things that may come out of a, uh, uh, a dictator, um, and how you would navigate this uh, simulated society to get your cause heard and, and dealt with in a nonviolent way. Um, but, you know, I, I would also want them to play a, a political game so that they can understand how more people could be educated about the political process. I mean, there are great games like, like this. I, I remember um, um, interviewing uh, Henry, in fact, I believe. It may have been you, Henry. Correct me if I'm wrong. But I remember um, hearing about a video game where a kid took the video game into uh, the school. And the video game was a uh, politically charged video game, a, a politically educational video game about the uh, Electoral College. And when the kid who found out and played the game by playing the game, ended up watching the news, started understanding why politicians were making certain trips to certain states and why they would stop and, and maybe even not just where they went, but what they're saying, why they're saying it. And so it was really interesting because the same kid that was playing this game, then watching television and, and learning, uh, took the game to school and was shut out by a teacher. You know, so had he had a, I don't know, a magazine about the same issue, I mean, I guess the magazine, or a book, or you know, any other accepted piece of material probably wouldn't have been fine, and, and not even really knowing what the game is about. So there's this, um, uh, you know, issue of, of, of that gatekeeper mentality as well, and so I think if I had this land party I, with Congress, I would certainly want them to play a game, number one, that they can relate to, and then um, hopefully be able to play a game that would push their mind mentally as to the possibilities of what games could do, whether that's a pain distraction game um, that's being developed at uh, some of the, uh, at the hosp at, um, 
uh, with breakaway games in Hunt Valley, Maryland with Mercy Hospital, which is a, a uh, pain distraction game for kids that are going through procedures that are uncomfortable and doctors are finding better success rate because the kids are playing these pain distraction games that are pleasant and keeps them relaxed. Uh, so I would want them to play things that would uh, take them out of just the, the, the military concepts and the simulations, but also kind of show them the educational value in games and where that could ultimately go and hopefully get a few of them to understand uh, what the potential could be. Ian, sticking with anything in which he can frag his congressman, so mm. yeah. I'll go to the next I question. I still think that's a good <laughs> choice. <laughs> I have two. I'm, I'm Joe Beckman. I do some community organizing in a couple of communities around Boston. I have two very different questions. The first question is sort of, I'll ask them both and then you can deal with them in any order you want. One is, uh, to take off of Henry's point, 12% of the, of the voters voted on Tuesday. Is it an unfair criterion to measure the effect of civic media of, or in the next five to 10 years to expect that ratio to be higher? And how would that happen? That's the first question. The second question is, why is there no game for school evaluation? There are standardized tests, but why not standardized interactive measures, which could be a game and could be online? Why has it not happened? Thank you. Um, well, well, there's the answer to the second question is is twofold. Uh, the the optimistic answer is that there are many researchers in the learning sciences working on on methods of um, uh, assessment for games that might lead to such a thing sometime in the future. Um, the, the more pessimistic version is that um, um, education is, our educational system is broken. Uh, so I don't know that we want to encourage uh, such a thing anyway. Um, the answer to the first question is, I think, yes and no. Um, and that, that's all. No. no um, <laughs> um, uh, I think, yes, it's reasonable to, to imagine that we might look at something like voter turnout um, as, a, as one aspect of, 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 of people's engagement with, uh, 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 with politics and, 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 and civic life generally, whether we're talking about games or not. Um, but the problem, I think, it has nothing to do with games really, is that voting, uh, public, uh, that, that kind of civic service uh, appears to people to be so decoupled from the, the, the policy decisions that affect their lives that it's almost um, reasonable to imagine why they don't bother and how can we, how can we deal with that fundamental problem mm -hmm. instead of the, uh, the, the problem of, uh, of the numbers at the, at the voting booth. Yeah, I can't hear you either. The, I, I guess the question was, even if you deal with that second issue that, that you mentioned, how, how would you actually engage people in that process then? How would you get them to see that? Oh, well, I mean, I mean, that's, I, I think, I'd like to think that's what I've been trying to do in, in, in my games about politics, you know, to, to demonstrate that the way that we frame um, uh, public policy issues um, is broken. So when we talk about, when we talk about um, obesity and we talk about it as, a, as an issue of self-control, um, that, uh, that, that has to do with um, people's uh, activity or lack of it that we, we kind of cover over issues of, of, um, of um, uh, socioeconomics, for, for example. And, and you know, ho hopefully by doing this, um, we ratchet up people's demands and they make different demands on, uh, on either their elected officials or just the, the ordinary people around them. Um, I mean, it's certainly, it's certainly not a clear path from A to B, yeah. Yeah. Um I don't really have too, too much more to, to add on to Ian other than an example that I can look towards um, where in Baltimore, for example, they have been talking about and have created an, an online space uh, specifically for high school kids that have an interest in politics. Um, so there's a little bit of a difference there, right? Because that means we're already saying they have an interest in it, so I, I understand that. But even still, um, and what they started, what we started with uh, Mayor O'Malley at first was just these open uh, chats that we would have with, uh, with youth and interfacing with government and interfacing specifically with City Hall on specific issues. And I think they've evolved that program now to it's, it's beyond a ask the mayor 
um, an issue. They've really harnessed that program now to take these students that come from various backgrounds throughout the city and bring them into City Hall to really uh, beyond a typical school tour uh, to expose them and actually put them to work in their classes about issues that the city council have actually dealt with, um, which uh, is, is from the teacher response that I've received has been interesting in seeing the debate and the discussion that these students are having um, about the political process. So I don't know if that's, go, if that's part of the answer that will uh, see more people want to <coughs> participate in, in the political culture, but I think that's one thing that would be, would be looked at as a noted example that's working well, at least in Baltimore anyway. Has voter participation changed? Um, <laughs> I wish I could say over, no. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it's too, it, no. It, it ha I mean, the answer for that question is it hasn't changed. I mean, we had low turnouts uh, as well. So we don't know if that's the answer yet. But from the discussions that we're hearing from students that, that don't care about politics versus the students that are in this program, uh, and even some of the students that didn't think they needed to be in it but were kind of just like coaxed into it, uh, you find that they're more engaged and at least more aware of issues that are happening. So um, it has brought a little bit more of a level of transparency uh, to, to how government operates, and I think that's important. I mean, we took them into a room uh, inside of uh, City Hall where we call, um, uh, gosh, it's, it's, we don't call it the war room. It's... Um, <laughs> that's what they call it. Though. That's what they <laughs> it feels like the war room, um, but it's a it's a it's a um, uh, an opportunity where all the agency heads of of the city come before a panel and, and they do this uh, once a week and they have to uh, pull up their spreadsheets and it's total transparency and so how many how many um, potholes were covered this week. Uh, well, X didn't get done. Well, well, then why is your overtime so high if X potholes weren't, weren't covered? And so when the kids can actually see that this type of dialogue and transparency and holding people accountable was happening, those kids, and, and that was a subset of the main group, but those kids had a um, more engaging conversation and debate and interest in watching the news and understanding what people are saying um, and reading the paper and going to online websites and participating. So whether or not that changes to voter turnout would be the hope, but I think that was a, that's a good start. Hello, um, I'm doing a project right now where um, I'm working with, I mean, it's called a Youth Activism Design Institute, and we're working with a bunch of young people that already are incredibly politically sophisticated, running political campaigns, um, doing youth organizing, and what we're trying to do is have them use the game design lens to reinvent their tactics around organizing. And I'm wondering what kind of um, experiences have you guys had in having um, uh, or of helping young people think like game designers, um, sort of getting young people to understand second order dynamics, um, the magic circle, like you know the, the lexicon that game designers have. Um, have you, what kind of experiences have you had in sort of lending that lens to people who already are politically savvy um, and, and, and what would you suggest we do? Or are there any particular tools or techniques you think we should be employing around that project? I'm, I'm sorry, can you, can you just clarify the goal of the, of the project a little more? Basically, you, uh, yeah. we're, we're trying to, so young people are doing good work on the ground but they don't necessarily always like the way they're approaching organizing. Sometimes they think it's dull. Sometimes they think it's too much like the way adults do it. Mm -hmm. And they like games, and they, they're interested in games, but they want to try to figure out how, how do game designers make their games fun? Like, what are the things they think about? Um, so they're interest, you're interested specifically in games about um, new, mo new methods of, of organizing? Is that right? No, no. Okay. It's about, the, they understand organizing. Yeah. And game designers understand game designers. Right. And our premise is that if young people understood what game designers understand about design okay. and how do, they, how do you make systems that, that attract people and make them play something for 120 hours, maybe they could do oh. that to get people involved in campaigns in ways that they can't right now. So we're trying to do that kind of translation. And I'm wondering, have you had any experience with that, if you have any suggestions for us around it? Make sense? That makes sense? I think Mario knows the answer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, thought with, I thought with your line of questioning, you, you, you had something coming towards him. <laughs> um, 
gosh, I was ready to, uh, I wasn't ready to go first. I think, um, <laughs> 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 transparent. <laughs> I, was, oh. I used my strategy on you. You, you did. <laughs> uh, you gamed me, uh, and it worked. Um, let me see if I could take a, a, a shot at this. I, I, think what, I think what I understand your question to be is a, a great one, number one, because I think it reminds me of the similar question that we were asking of how do we use the video game development process to tie that to core academics. Um, and so that, that brings you into, well, what's the mindset of the gamer or of the designer, rather, and, 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 and uh, what excites them? And, you know, but it's tough because you know, what you think excites them um, may not really be what they're working on at the time. I mean, and I'm not to say that they don't have a passion for working on the game, but the, the, the game is, is hot pizza when, when it starts out, when you're in that embryonic stage and you're having discussions about the game and, and you're designing your thoughts and you're putting it all out. Uh, but after six months, it's the same pizza and it's now cold pizza. <laughs> and so you bring up a good point because how do you maintain, and you can speak to this, Ian, how do you maintain your interest, your energy, and your excitement with something that has small steps that need to, be, that need to uh, have been taken in order to create a big accomplishment and a bigger goal at the end? I, I, you know, for you, I wonder if, um, oh, uh, you might have to, I'm gonna shift it back, I'm gonna game Ian. I, I think on the <laughs> mental side, I think on the mental side, Ian may have some ideas, I'm assuming, but. Um, I think from, 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 from tools, from tools that maybe you could use, I would certainly look at games that are involved in exactly what you have these youth involved in. I would, I would certainly, I mean, come see me after this and, and look at this game of Force More Powerful. This may um, help, help them understand the design and the energy and the fun that they put into this particular game, which is all about accomplishing something of a common goal, which you're trying to do uh, with these kids. And being that they're already savvy, it's just a matter of getting them around the right tools. But you know, one of the things that you may also want to look at are tools that are available, like Alice. I mean, or, or maybe even a step up from that, like um, uh, personal learning editions of, uh, of Autodesk. Um, th these are, are software uh, that are out there but are available. And maybe you could uh, excite your kids or excite the youth to have them use the tools, learn about the tools to see if they can come up with some ways of using the tools to help them with their, their organizing or just make it more engaging and fun. But as it speaks to the, the mentality, um, you know, it's hot pizza when it starts and then it's cold pizza until it's time to release the game and then it's hot pizza again. So uh, I don't really know what goes on in their mind throughout that process. I haven't studied that side of, 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 of that engagement. I, I, I don't, I'll admit that I don't have a good answer, uh, which is why I skirted the, 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 the question. <laughs> um, but, but I do want to note that, um, uh, that Katie Salen, who was, who was here a couple weeks ago, right, um, and Game Lab and the University of Wisconsin are working on a project that was funded by MacArthur to produce a, a game, correct me here if I'm getting it wrong, um, a, a game that would, that would actually enact some of the principles of, of game design itself. And I'm not sure what the calendar is for that, but it's approaching some kind of state of, of completion, I think. Um, so maybe keep, keep, some, keep an eye out for, for, for that as well. Yeah, and maybe just speak, maybe speak to game designers as well. I mean, I can help you with Definitely that as well. Definitely don't recommend speaking to game designers. You don't <laughs> <laughs> but I can help, I'm more than, welcome, more than happy to try to point you to some resources that would be open to talking to you that are in that there, business. There are, I mean, in all seriousness, and, and there, there are these books out there, and there's one even that's called like, you know, Game Development for Teens, you know, which sounds, oh, that must be right, you know, so it's <laughs> definitely got the right title. Yeah, right. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a black art um, still uh, for me, and I don't, I, I don't know that, uh, that, that there are, are, are straight answers anywhere. Hi, Gene Koo from the Berkman Center for Internet Society at Harvard. And I work a lot, and I'm married to um, a lot of, um, I'm married to only one person, but I, <laughs> <laughs> I work a lot Oh, this with. is an interesting question <laughs> here. Yeah. Um, Ian? <laughs> so we made a game about that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> community and grassroots organizers <laughs> who are, who are often okay. um, very skeptical of a lot of different new ways of doing things. And, and I remember going to one office where there was a comic strip on the, on, pinned up on the cubicle with two frames in it. And the first frame 
it has uh, kind of a church basement, and there's a, there's a person who's saying, oh, they're, they're about to debate a new uh, law about abortion, and then you have all these people in the room like saying, well, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to you know, call on my friends and have them write to their senator, and um, you know, I'm going to basically go door to door and get people to, to kind of do something about this. And you have the second frame, and they say, well, there's a, there's a new kind of uh, law you know, about uh, kind of also about abortion, and, and it's, it's like in, in a coffee shop, and everyone's like, well, I'm going to do my interpretive dance tomorrow about this, and you know, I'm going I'm to do a film festival about this issue. And at the bottom of the of the, the title for the comic strip is you know why liberals lose, um, and you can put aside the the you know the ideological leaning of that particular comic strip. But um, what I what uh, some of what I've been hearing about so far has been how game media uh, or any, a lot of this kind of mass media in general can really shape or change attitudes. And uh, I'm not saying I completely agree with that comic strip, but there is a feeling of well, if you just make people aware of things or more knowledgeable about things or just put it in their face, that somehow magically something will happen. And I'm curious if, if you could speak to basically is the, the, where you see the mechanism between awareness of an issue or being more knowledgeable about something and then actually going and doing something about it. What's the difference between uh, doing the interpretive dance and making a phone call to your, to your senator? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the, when, when someone says that's a great question when you ask a question, it means <laughs> they're not quite sure what to say next. Uh, the, no, the, 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 in my experience working with, with, um, with all, all groups on, on multiple sides of the, of the political spectrum, multiple parts of the political spectrum. It's not so much about um, different strategies. I mean, everyone goes door to door and everyone puts out media. It's about the, uh, I think, the, the risks that we take when we, when we do those things. Um, so I've had a number of, of, of games about um, political topics um, effectively um, you know, censored into oblivion by, by Democrats. Um, and then um, the, the work that I've done um, with, uh, with Republicans has, has been really been interesting in, in, in showing me um, just how, how much uh, more willing, it's kind of ironic, right? You're supposed to be conservative. Um, how much more willing um, uh, uh, they are to accept a kind of boldness of speech. Um, so I think part of it is, is honesty. And, uh, and that, that doesn't have anything to do with, um, with games again uh, anymore, although there, maybe there's something we can, we can get at there. But yeah, this, this framing problem of sort of, you know, We'll, we'll, we'll go and we'll talk about um, you know uh, 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 an issue among ourselves uh, w w at the coffee shop, uh, rather than go and muster uh, you know kind of strategic uh, politically strategic um, strategies to to gain uh, voter share and that sort of thing, um, is really a, a much bigger issue than I'm than I'm prepared to answer on here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rafi Santo. I work with uh, Global Kids. Um, so I, I've got a question that's been on my mind for a while now. Um, in looking at the world of gaming and those thinking critically about gaming, specifically about gaming and how it relates to the social good, I kind of see two uh, strains of thought. One is the games for change uh, kind of uh, outlook, and one is the games and learning outlook. Uh, and these really deal with two specific uh, different kinds of ideas about what we're trying to teach. One is about attitudes and perspectives, and one is about skills. And so you have um, people like James Paul G. talking about games uh, like Full Spectrum Warrior, how it teaches uh, these incredible skills about um, you know, what it means to embody the discipline of a soldier, and what it means to uh, embody you know, all of these kinds of specific skills around controlling teams. Uh, and then you've got, on the other side, kind of uh, games like uh, Ian, like you create, that are persuasive games, news games, uh, games with an agenda, be it political or moral, social. Uh, and they, they're, they're basically uh, coming from a perspective that says we can, through games, convince people uh, to act in a different way. And so uh, to me, it actually looks like these two, two uh, standpoints are at odds with each other. Because uh, if you take the uh, games and like, the persuasive games perspective and you apply it to the, the first model, where you've got these army games, you're basically saying, okay, so we're teaching people to kill. Um, and something like America's Army actually explicitly you know, does that. Uh, and then the other side, you're, uh, you're kind of saying, okay, so with games that are persuasive, what kind of skills are they actually learning? You know, so I'm wondering if there's something that uh, might be on your minds that can rectify those two worlds. I'm happy to report there's a chapter of my book about this. <laughs> <laughs> to which I might refer you. I mean, the basic, basic answer I give is that um, both the uh, 
the idea of, of abstract skills and the idea of, of some kind of, of transfer of subject specificity are, are, are insufficient. And um, in fact, what we need is a kind of a tight coupling between the, um, uh, the mechanics of the game and, the, uh, and the, the, the concept that it's relating, that that aboutness always matters and we can't ignore it. Um, and at the same time, once we admit that something is potentially educational, then it might have other kinds of, we have to admit that there are these, these other possible outcomes uh, that also occur. Right? So I, I, I'm not terribly bothered by um, the existence of both uh, you know, military games and uh, pacifist games. They just simply have different agendas at work. No, I think, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, when you think about games for change and uh, games for learning, um, it's, fortunately, I don't have to try to differentiate between the two, quite frankly. Uh, I understand the question and understand why that's important. And I think it um, speaks to, I, I say I don't need to because uh, I'm so focused on the games for learning and for me, for whatever reason, when we're dealing with the students and the games for learning that we're going through, that is change um, or it is games for change and not in the same definition that you subscribe, uh, describe, but um, it, 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 there is change that's taking place. So, and a game is responsible for that change. Uh, I understand it's not a specific agenda, but I, there is a, a specific agenda to what we want these kids to get out of the program. So um, I, I do see this conflict, if you will, uh, of that question, but I don't really see it formulating itself through our students. I don't really see that happening in the classroom. What I do see with this uh, dilemma is, and I, you know, I don't want anyone to f feel like their good work is going down the drains, but I think that I just don't know that if we've reached a point where we have the right standardizations of the terminology for what we're trying to do here. And I think part of that question brings up this issue of, of the language. Video game right. is, the, is the right terminology. Is that the term? Yeah, I mean, I right, think. That's the right word. No, I mean, that's good to know. I mean, that's good to hear. Is that, is that the term that we should say? Because the minute you say that term, to some people, uh, the, the, only, the, the, only way we, the only way we make any progress here is by, by investing some concept with meaning that grows. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and if we start splintering, um, splintering off different kinds of, of topics into, into whole different you know, genres of a medium that have nothing to do with one another, then I think we lose the leverage that we gain from, mm -hmm. from, the, from the other aspects. So I'm, I'm completely committed to that. Well, so let me ask one other question j just to you. Does, is serious game something we should stop saying? Yeah. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure everyone was clear. Thank you for that concise answer. <laughs> Par partially because um, the, the, our close is coming, I'm going to take one more question, and partially because Mario mentioned hot pizza recently, and it's gotten me thinking ever <laughs> since then. So, so we're going to try to draw things to a close. We'll take one last question, and then I'll ask some closing comments. I'm Michael Scholar with American Public Media, and we've created um, some journalism games. Games are powerful in that they're really good at teaching a system. So if you want to teach physics as an educational game, you kind of give rules and then you let people apply them. Mm -hmm. They're also great at teaching a system if almost implicitly you create a situation, you have someone live in it, and they learn the rules of the game. They learn what it takes to win. And I think that's what concerns me as we branch out into games for civic engagement, is that someone's writing the rules into a game that basically is implicitly teaching what it takes to win. And often the games that are persuasive games, advocacy games, um, often teach a set of rules that, that are in someone's interest. Um, and often I think actually turn people off from civic engagement. One classic example is um, games around elections and politics that always have a little person warning you that, gee, if you adopt this policy, you're going to get voted out of office. <laughs> so what we're in implicitly teaching is that the rules of the game are to act like a politician. We're not actually teaching people about the issues, for example, in that type of game, and, and where you should come out on issues based on what's going to improve society or the like. And I guess I, I raise this more to get some thoughts as to trying to create a, a fine line for a journalism game that isn't advocacy, but is really about educating about attempting to educate about the truth, about the way the world works, but in a, a, a way that actually leaves um, possibilities and openness. Games inherently are kind of closed systems where the rules get set and everything you do kind of works against the rules. One thing I've been thinking about and haven't 
quite figured out how to do because the complexity gets gets um, uh, gets high very quickly is to have games that actually have open answers where users can actually create new scenarios, provide new information um, about a game as they go. It's kind of akin to the Star Trek, you know, uh, movie where Captain Kirk rewrote the rules of the game because it was a game that had no way out. Um, and in some ways, I think one of the problems we have in media today and with civic engagement and low voting rates is that people in some way feel that the rules of the game are such that there's no way out. People can't actually influence politics anymore. So I, I guess I'm, I'm asking some thoughts on whether or not there's an inherent structural problem in, in civic engagement games and that someone's got to write the rules that kind of implicitly hold a view of how society works. This is the question we're going to end on? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I we'd end on a small throwaway question. <laughs> I guess I can't say a yes won't work here. Really. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, th th there's an inherent um, conflict between politics and policy. Forget about the games. That are, that's just there. So what you say about, about games, about the political process, I completely agree with. You know, we, what, what you learn is, the, uh, what you learn is, is, is campaigning. You don't learn policy. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that the answer is, is to open up um, a system so that you can do anything with it. Uh, I, I think that we have, to, we have to, to learn and we have to help other people learn that just like any kind of artifact, a game um, makes, a, makes claims. It has, it has opinions and those opinions are um, built into the rules, into the processes that are, that are, that by which the game works. And we need to learn to read those and understand, oh gosh, this is, this is actually where the argument's located. What is it trying to tell me about um, the way the world works or the way that it might under someone's leadership or, or so forth? Um, now, I don't know, because all of those things are very specific, it, it, it's going to be very, very hard, if not impossible, to design some, some metagame where all possible representations are, are available. Um, and moreover, I don't want all possible representations. I want someone's um, single representation of an issue that they believe is right and want to convince me of. And then I want a whole wealth of those that I can, I can kind of interact with and make decisions between, um, hopefully leading me to make real decisions um, or, or at least to, uh, to, to, uh, to facilitate others to make those decisions. Yeah, my, my two cents, I think, on this are, um, one, I, I think... Uh, I don't know that I would want to play a totally uh, open-ended game either, but I do respect the idea of being able to develop a game uh, from my perspective. And I do think what we need to start doing is letting more of um, people that play games be able to design scenarios within those games. Now, granted, there still are some rules about even just the design exactly. of what you yeah. can do in a game. So. It still doesn't really solve the answer yeah, to... Yeah, scenario design, right, is just going to ideologize the, the, the question of what, what kind of options are available in the first place. Right, I mean, so you're, you're kind of still back to square one, although you may have given someone the idea or the perception that they're really changing some things. Um, but I, I think on a bigger picture, this kind of goes to uh, what I think is a problem in media. Um, and I think it's the diversity. Uh, I mean, there's several issues with, with this question, but I think one is if you felt that news sources um, were, were more demographically made up of the society that you live in, you would, one could say that the perspectives of that news organization would be more uh, encompassing of its, its communities that it serves. Um, and one could say the same thing about a video game. In other words, if you have a democratic process throughout the design of a video game and you allow people to challenge each other with what the roles or the outcomes or the challenges would be, um, I think you, you end up with something that leads towards maybe where you would like to go but doesn't ultimately solve uh, that, that, uh, that question that you pose. But I do think that that's a real issue that needs to be addressed in the industry. When I talk to uh, game designers of different backgrounds and you speak to them be outside of the microphone, or when the camera is turned off and you have a, a cordial upfront discussion with them, the, the stories of um, you know, some of the things that happen in game development remind you of uh, some of the same things that happen in other industries. But when you hear about 
the, the shining moments are those where you find that true diversity has been embraced by the company from the top, and that has really found itself uh, drilled down into the development of the games um, and to a larger library of potential games. Uh, because one thing's for sure, right? We can't continue to just um, create uh, blockbuster titles. I mean, that's that's a, a death of the industry. So things like persuasive games, right? Not you know. blockbuster titles, by the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but but no, wondering. but that's going to, that's going to obviously that's clearly going to change. No, that's going to change. I I, I firmly I'll show believe. Show you my wallet. So I, I, when no. we're finished. Yeah, you can stay the course. Stay, <laughs> Ian. Stay the course. <laughs> I firmly have to believe that that's going to change. Um, so I, I mean, I hope that helps. But also, you know, there you, you look at Microsoft, who's opened up um, a little bit, right? Uh, XNA is is a, is a, dev um, a platform. If you haven't heard of it, this XNA platform is, in theory, supposed to allow people uh, that want to design to be able to uh, take components of games that they play and be able to design upon them, and then maybe even offer them up into uh, the Xbox Live marketplace. And what's interesting is you start seeing games that are not like what you would expect. You start seeing games about issues and about things that are being discussed in the news. Um, uh, so, so I, you know, that doesn't fully answer your question, but I think that gives you an understanding of at least where I'm seeing some things. And I think as long as, is your, is your newsroom diverse? <laughs> We're working on it. But those are terrific answers. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Yeah, I think it starts um, there for me. I, I'll offer an opportunity. I know we've, we've run over. I'll offer an opportunity for the, for the speakers to have one minute to any final thoughts. I want to meet Ian's kid, <laughs> five-year-old genius. <laughs> um, so I, I mean, you know, the, the j just just to summarize um, some of the ideas. The I think the important thing to realize with respect to games and, and and civic engagement is that this is actually a very different kind of computer medium than the sort that we've been discussing primarily in um, in in this kind of conversation or in the in the broader. Um, uh, uh, public discourse, wh wh which is stuff like um, you know websites and and and, mm -hmm. and, and social networks and, and, and these sorts of things. Blogs, yeah. um, there's something fundamentally different about about video games and the way that they represent what they do with the computer, uh, and their potential is is uh, considerably untapped. Um, so I just want to draw attention to that as as a kind of closing um, uh, comment that there's there's something that that can be done here that hasn't yet, and it's something that uh, that I think takes advantage. Of, of computers um, in a way that uh, that other kinds of media haven't. So now maybe it's time to uh, to, to to do some catch up. Yeah, um, I, I you know I think in closing I think um, you know there's so much that my mind is racing to want to want to try to squeeze in right to, to to close out with, but I think as as it relates to uh, the theme of tonight's discussion, um, we see a society where um, access to technology is becoming more prevalent. Um, we're seeing a society where broadband connections make the speed of communication that much faster. We're seeing a, a mobile society that's becoming wireless. And um, you know, when I walk around now and see uh, kids that are just were just learning computers a year ago, now telling me, Mr. Armstrong, you know, I know how to get RSS feeds. Um, that that tells me something about. Um, their propensity, their potential, and their understanding of technology as it equates to information. And when exposed correctly, as that information can equate to influence and empower them to make decisions. I think video games, th this meeting um, filled with so many great questions, have some, some answers uh, that just aren't there because it's, it w they need to be done, they need to be developed, it needs to be researched. And this is a great exposure of the opportunity of what the medium of video games has to offer uh, civic engagement. I go back to the one story. When I asked a kid, and I challenge any of you, when you leave here tonight, go and ask. Ask kids you don't talk to. Ask someone at the, at the, at the line, at, at a, a, res a restaurant. Ask them uh, when you're at the gas station. Ask them in public places. If you were to create a game, what would that game be? And if you actually take notes as to what some of these kids uh, dressed in various ways from various backgrounds, 
uh, had to say, I think many of you might be as shocked as I was and optimistic about where things could go if the education and exposure could get to them at a level and at an age where they're willing to accept it and be influenced by it. I'm speaking of middle school primarily. Um, so I think that's where I would like to, to leave it. So I'd, I'd like to thank our speakers um, and, of course, the Communications Forum, yeah. the Center for Future Civic Media, um, and the Knight Foundation for their support. Um, and uh, hopefully the pizza has not gotten cold because <laughs> we've run a few minutes over. But uh, Hopefully uh, not. You. Don't blame me. <laughs> and thank you for a lot of great questions. Yeah, really. It's great time. Thank you.